Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for the second annual Perspectives Conference. My name is Robert Coronado, Jr., and I will be the moderator tonight. I am one of the editors-in-chief alongside Cole Costello and Christina Esquivel for this year's volume of Perspectives, a journal of historical inquiry. Our student history journal at Cal State LA, which will be celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Before we get started with our presentations, I would like to thank the many people who have made tonight's event possible. These include Dr. Kitty Ali and Dr. Enrique C. Ochoa, who graciously offered their time giving feedback to our presenters on earlier drafts of their presentations, Monet Brown, who created the flyer for tonight's event, Cole Costello, Daylene Burgada, and David Martinez, who helped organize this event, our faculty advisor, Dr. Virta Flager, who offered crucial feedback on our organization and planning of this event throughout the semester, my fellow Perspectives team members who have worked hard on this year's volume of Perspectives in this corresponding conference. It has been such an enjoyable and fruitful experience. And last but not least, I would like to thank our presenters for investing hours upon hours of hard work into their presentations to teach us about the findings of their research. I would like to give a, a brief outline regarding the structure of tonight's online event. Our three presenters will each present their research and then we will have time for questions and comments from the audience. We ask that you keep yourself muted until the Q&A portion. And if you do have any questions that you raise your hand during the Q&A portion or type your question in the chat. Thank you in advance for your participation. And with that being said, let us begin. Our first presenter, uh, Maricela Varela Ramos, is currently finishing her undergraduate studies at Cal State LA, majoring in history with a minor in religious studies. Her research interests include the cultural impact of Latin American indigenous civilizations on modern society and the religious influence behind many world conflicts. Upon graduation, she will continue to write and hopes to contribute her research to various journals and magazines and eventually write a book. Maricela will now present her paper titled Camaraderie Over Concentration, The Relocation of Japanese Mexicans in World War II Mexico. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Robert. Uh, again, my name is Maricela Varela Ramos. Uh, I am a history major here at Cal State LA with a minor in religious studies. Uh, thank you all for putting these presentations together. I know my fellow presenters and I are very excited to be with you tonight. Uh, so, as many of us know, uh, Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor led to the internment of Japanese Americans. What many of us may not have known is that Mexico and its citizens were also affected. Today, I will explore what led to Mexico's decision to relocate their citizens of Japanese descent, the role the U.S. played in this decision, and how these citizens and communities were affected in comparison to their American counterparts. Prior to December 7th, 1941, most Mexican citizens did not harbor many anti-Japanese sentiments. There was a good relationship between Mexico, both between the governments and the citizens. Uh, this relationship was one of mutual support and respect. Japanese migration into Mexico began in the late 19th century under the presidency of Porfirio Diaz. Uh, these uh, migrants came into the areas of Chiapas and Oaxaca, where they worked in coffee plantation, mines, and as landscapers. Here we have an immigration card of one of the uh, immigrants from Japan. And you'll see that usually these cards, uh, these are the cards that everyone received. They listed, you know, their dates of birth, general information, but also their occupation to show how they would be a contribution to Mexico. Uh, this here, again, uh, Tatsuguro Matsumoto is a landscape artist, and he is actually highly regarded amongst the Mexican elite. One of his gardens still stands today at the Chopo Museum in Mexico City. By 1941, there were about 6,000 Japanese immigrants and about 13,000 Mexican-born citizens of Japanese ancestry. During this time, tensions between the US and Japan continued to grow. Uh, while these tensions grew, Mexico began to struggle to maintain uh, its relationship between both uh, with the U.S. and with Japan. Uh, Mexico appreciated the support that they received from Japan during its revolution. 
During the Mexican Revolution, the U.S. persecuted General Pancho Villa, and this further strained the relationship between the U.S. and Mexico. In 1942, the FBI compiled a report detailing what they described as a plan of invasion through the Republic of Mexico. Unfortunately, it was based on hearsay and newspaper articles written by highly biased reporters, as Japan had no such plan. Mexican nationals uh, initially resisted the anti-Japanese propaganda that was coming into Mexico from the U.S., and the Mexican government went as far as to assure the Japanese government that they would not harass, mistreat, or expel other citizens of Japanese descent. Eventually, however, uh, there came a point where, unfortunately, Mexico was not able to remain neutral in this battle between the U.S. and Japan. President Manuel Avila Camacho did not have the support from the Mexican people, and he faced the real threat of a coup from within his administration. He did, however, have the support of the American government. So while there's no hard evidence that has yet been uncovered, it seems that this need to keep the support of the American government is what eventually led to his decision to relocate its citizens of Japanese descent. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with this decision to relocate, there really came no support from the government. Uh, here in the United States, um, you know, when Japanese citizens received their notification that they had to be relocated, uh, it came with actual, you know, government officials coming in and there were caravans and they were removing uh, these citizens and moving them into camps. That, unfortunately, was not the case in Mexico. So when they did receive their letters in the mail indicating that they had to relocate from the coastal cities inland, the majority of the citizens who did not have to relocate and, you know, had some comfort in their lives decided that they would create a committee which would support these individuals. So this became the Comité Japonés de Ayuda Mutua, or the Japanese Committee for Mutual Aid. Um, this committee provided uh, the, these Japanese immigrants with transportation, and they actually arranged housing when the government did not arrange it for them. These citizens were then moved uh, to different locations, and the majority of them were moved to what was called at that time by Mexican citizens, concentration camps. Um, now, I know that it for some of us, the term concentration camp, you know, it makes us think of, you know, the atrocities that were being committed in Europe. And while that was not the case in uh, Mexico, uh, there is a strong, uh, there is a strong sense that the term concentration camp continued to be used because it was essentially a concentration of Japanese immigrants. So that is the reason why the term concentration camp continues to be used. It is in no way comparing it to what was happening in Europe, as you know, we know that they obviously didn't have knowledge of what was happening then. Uh, so one of the uh, camps is actually in Teshmico, Morelos, and it's unfortunately now a water park. Um, there is a small plaque at the very entrance that mentions that this at one point was a concentration camp, uh, but unfortunately there is no other mention of what happened at this camp during the time. It is simply a water park for people to come to enjoy. Um, it, residents at this camp did unfortunately face extreme poverty. Uh, while men could leave camp, that's something that was different from the uh, Japanese intern here in the US. In Mexico, they were able to leave the camp on a daily basis to gather supplies and anything else that their families would need while in the camp. They were not, however, able to work. So uh, the, the citizens in these camps did face extreme poverty. Oftentimes it fell on the wives to work and create businesses to move their families forward. When uh, the majority of these Japanese immigrants came into Mexico, the majority of them were young men who were coming to work. So they found Mexican born national uh, women to marry. Uh, so these women were able to work and they were the ones who were trying to keep their families financially afloat. Um, unfortunately, some of these families, upon hearing of the poverty in the camps, once they had to move, they decided to leave their children with either family members that didn't have to relocate or neighbors who offered their support. Some of these families and children, unfortunately, were never able to be reunited. And some of these families, of course, they lost their homes, they lost their businesses, um, financially they were completely ruined, and some of them were never able to fully recover. 
there was a group, however, of Japanese citizens who wanted to provide as much support possible for the rebuilding of these communities. And so what they did is they created a newspaper called El Heraldo de Nisei. And through this newspaper, they provided citizens with information for jobs, information for business opportunities, uplifting stories, anything they could do to uplift the community to allow them to rebuild again. Today, there are over 35,000 individuals of Japanese descent in Mexico. And while the trauma of what they experienced then does still exist, they are now thriving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisela. Um, so our next presenter, uh, Cristina Esquivel, is a first-generation Los Angeles native Chicana receiving her Bachelor of Arts degree in history at Cal State LA. Upon graduating, she will pursue a master's in Latin American studies and a social sciences teaching credential, seeking a career in ethnic studies. Her interests include the intersectionality of class, gender, and race in the historical analysis of colonial Mexico, Native American history, reconstruction in the US, and marginalized communities of the 19th and 20th centuries. Christina will now present her paper titled, Gender, Sex, and Familia behind closed doors of the Bracero experience. Uh, hi, um, thank you, Robert, for that introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. As Robert said, uh, my name is Cristina Esquivel, a history major with a teacher prep option. Um, so my research focuses on how the Bracero program disrupted gender roles, sexuality, masculinity, and women's autonomy shifting uh, social identities. Aside from my family photos, my visuals were collected by the Bracero archive. And when I began to search for women's photos affected by this program, can you guess how many I found? About three. This solidifies the understudied peripherals of the Bracero program. Thanks to these scholars, I gathered enough evidence to substantiate my research. Here's a picture of my abuelito Paco and me taken earlier this year. He tells me, on my days off, I wanted to go to public spaces, but there were signs, no Mexicans. Even though they did not want us here in the States, I still felt proud of being on US land. I needed to provide. We worked hard and late, they treated us badly, but they paid us. And with that, I would send it back to Durango so your grandma could eat. His story, one of many, epitomizes the Mexican farm labor program, otherwise known as the Bracero program. On August 4th, 1942, an agreement between the US and Mexico allowed temporary man laborers to work legally in the US. 4.5 million workers were imported from 1942 to 1964, and most braceros were directed to California, Texas, and other Southern states. This program only hired males who underwent health inspections, physical exams, and were chemically sprayed for delousing. In a name to modernize Mexico during its post-revolution era, braceros sent remittances to support their family, contributing to Mexico's economy. Its elites wanted their men to return as skilled labor, strengthening its labor workforce and abolishing the traditional Indio or Indian. In Mexico, men typically were the decision makers of the home and we could conclude that their masculinity was challenged. They went from being heads of household to becoming submissive and dominated by their employers on the fields. Thus, Sending money back created a transnational connection, keeping an international patriarchal tie and men's masculinity intact. Their role made family feels an emotional bond in which the money symbolized thoughts and love while also giving a sense of still being the provider despite their humiliation on the fields. By 1944, it's estimated that Bracero sent $1 million to their loved ones. The amount sent back individually was not enough to sustain the family. So where does that leave the women? Women became resourceful and creative to supply for their families. As we see in the picture to the left, 
Many women migrated to work in cities, farmland, and or sell food to braceros at the border as they waited for their contracts. They were expected to be caregivers and although married were still single parents. Avila mentions Modesta, a domestic worker who worked up to 14 hours a day and relied on family and others. Women like her created networks amongst themselves during these trying times. However, their vulnerability was left open to physical attacks because others knew that male protection was absent. Bracero wives received the whiplash from the community too. Traditionally, a woman's role was in the home modeling uh, La Virgen de Guadalupe, who was righteous, obedient, and self-sacrificing to her children. As a result, others judged them for being out on the street. Here we start to see women's gender roles shifting from the private to the public sphere. This evolved into women raising sons and daughters who saw them act independently, altering and disrupting the traditional roles in Mexican society. Cooking was considered a woman's duty. However, gender roles blurred for men in the camps. On their days off, typically Sunday, men would go grocery shopping. While, while they had little money, a lack of speaking English and not knowing how to read, they had trouble shopping for food. They would buy the usual staples their wives cooked at home, like beans, rice, tortillas. In one instance, they bought cans of what looked like meat and mixed it with their rice and beans, turning out to be dog food. They still ate it, but made sure not to make the same mistake again. Elvira Moreno wrote to the president on February 29, 1944, requesting to work in the fruit packing industries of California. The director of government employment responded that no agreement relative to the contract labor of women existed between the two governments. Even though the canning and packing of fruit boomed during World War II, agreements still denied the need for women migrant workers. They were forced to work outside the home while serving their country in the private sphere. In another example, a group of women wrote to Presidente Avila Camacho on May 12, 1945, to offer their services in the U.S. as nurses. But their application was forwarded to the Ministry of Government, not the Ministry of Labor an indication that they were not considered for labor contracts abroad, even when appealing in a specifically gendered way. This influenced the migration of all, despite the required paperwork, leading to men, women, and families crossing the border on their own accord, thus disrupting the family dynamic during and after the program. While some men remain faithful to their wives, others distance themselves from their heteronormative family expectation. This program expanded sexuality that redefined gender, the family, and masculinity. This allowed them to labor and survive away from their traditional homes, leading to sexual freedoms. Although their bodies were used for labor productions, they still found ways to engage in pleasure and recreation, redefining and reclaiming their bracero bodies. In some cases, men purposely separated from their hometowns for their self-interest. For example, Losa writes about Guardad Montelongo, who began to date the farm owner's daughter in hopes of taking over the farm despite having a wife in Mexico. Montelongo realized other men would expose him, so he decided to return to his wife in Mexico. He believed that infidelity did not affect her because he chose his marriage. Women's sexuality started shifting their identity. Sex work indicated that women's roles were changing, and since men traveled back and forth, sex became a vent for both genders, males being the consumers in effort to reclaim their bodies. Although not all women engaged in this, once a woman decided to migrate, it was assumed she participated in this trade. Once they returned, Braceros would not want to continue married to a woman of questionable sexual virtue. As Braceros' exploitation and low wages generated vices and new freedoms. It influenced their lack of finances. Economies geared the Braceros increased. Ability to send back finances decreased. For example, when Braceros got paid, they could 
cash your checks in cantinas at no charge, making it more desirable for them to consume liquor. The bar owners, sex workers, and American products made available during payday cater to fulfill the needs of guest workers. The vices surfacing during Bracero times had a significant impact on the family unit. Their morals, health, and safety, and family health were challenged. A combination of drinking and gambling accounted for 91% of reported Bracero violence. For some, having an entire paycheck although not very much, was the first time they felt independency and adequacy as men engendered their masculinity. In some cases, braceros engaged in pleasure with sex workers and contracted STDs, spreading it to their wives when they returned to Mexico as their contract ended. Not all braceros engaged in activities previously mentioned, in leisure time, it was common for braceros to attend movie theaters, play cards, or commune with one another. As women's networks strengthened, so did men's. These homosocial spaces allowed them to rediscover themselves and gain agency in new ways. Here we see a picture of my grandparents decades later. These loving images exemplify the great qualities the bracero program brought. However, not all stories ended up this way. My research tells a different story besides the traditional historical narrative. It captures this program's marginalized experience and complexities. The dynamic of gender roles, masculin masculinity, and autonomy evolving cause a ripple effect on those surrounding them literally and transnationally. As my abuelita Raquel states, I had to do what I had to do while I waited for your grandfather, Paco, alone, but full of hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Our last presenter, Eduardo Magallanes, is a first-generation undergraduate student at Cal State LA, pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree in history with the teacher's preparation option. He is planning to continue his education to obtain a single-subject teaching credential in social sciences upon graduating this May. Eduardo will now present his paper titled Propaganda in Motion, American Agitprop in War Films, 1941 to 2004. Thank you, Robert. Good evening, my name is Eduardo Magallanes. I'm a history major at Cal State LA. American war films are an important part of America's culture. These films are easily digestible and retell a patriotic story of how the hero comes to save a foreign nation from evil. American war films project the patriotic and nationalistic image onto the big screen and the viewer's sense of morality becomes manipulated to support an agenda. This is achieved through propaganda. Propaganda by definition influences or persuades an audience to advance an agenda. Uh, but propaganda does not necessarily mean the agenda is bad, but it's up to the viewer to interpret the meaning and the message behind the film. Propaganda is used to justify wars because the reality is it's difficult to convince the people to support war. State propaganda is backed by the state, and later on we'll be focusing on a critical counter-narrative. Uh, America had been involved with a lot of wars, and I narrowed it down to the ones that had more significance in world history and meaningful propaganda used in film. Many of these films were made during crucial times, which had significant purposes to being made. I was surprised to find that the government was involved in a lot of films. This ranged from President Roosevelt approaching Hollywood to request films being made to the Department of Defense, allowing the use of the aircraft carriers and fighter jets. We'll be going through a timeline starting with World War I because of its significance in world history and any with the Afghanistan and Iraq war because of their impact on the world stage. We will see how American war culture and propaganda evolved through film as we start with the film from 1941 and end with a documentary from 2004. We will see how the government used films as state propaganda to create a sense of patriotism, but films will later evolve to become critical, critical counter narratives to criticize the wars and government. Sergeant York, based on a true story, follows a young American Christian man named Alvin Colum York. He is drafted into World War I, and he is exempted from the war as a conscientious objector on the grounds of freedom of religion. 
He ultimately joins the war stating, because I have received my assurance, I have received it from God himself that it's right for me to go to war and that as long as I believe in him, not one hair on my head will be harmed. The film was made with the intention of using propaganda to help create a sense of patriotism to help recruit Americans for World War I or World War II by utilizing Christianity in this film. We move on to World War II in the film Casablanca, where Morocco is occupied by the and controlled by the pro-German Vichy regime. Lowell Mele is an American journalist and he became the coordinator of government films. The Motion Picture Bureau of the New Office of War Information allowed the government to have bigger input into propaganda films so they can enlist the help of Hollywood to create films. Uh, this included uh, Warner Bros. Studios, which produced Casablanca. Uh, there's an important scene in this film where the Casablanca club's band and guests are singing the French national anthem, drowning out the Nazis singing their national anthem. The club patrons are all from different European countries and them singing the French national anthem is a theme of European unification against fascism. The state propaganda used here is to create anti-Nazi, anti-Axis and European unification. Moving along, The Rack is an American Korean war film that highlights the use of propaganda because it reflects the anxieties at the time surrounding Americans returning as prisoners of war. It focuses a lot on the threats of communism it showed how vulnerable young Americans can be susceptible to communism. And the film suggests the consequences of communism is committing treason against the United States of America. The propaganda used in the film shows Captain Edwards as a physically strong American, but his mental fortitude was very weak. He commits treason and his sentence is a foreboding warning of communism in America. Full Metal Jacket was made after the Vietnam War but it portrays the Vietnam War. And this is a turning point where we see a shift from propaganda to a critical counter narrative that challenges the narratives that we have already seen. We, the public opinion of the Vietnam War was turning and becoming an unpopular war. And the film Private Joker is in a meeting with his editorials and Lieutenant Lockhart says, why say North Vietnamese army regular? Is there an irregular? How about North Vietnamese army soldier? Search and destroy is now sweeping clear. If we move Vietnamese, they are evacuees. If they come to us to be evacuated, they are refugees. The film's uh, critical counter narrative criticizes um, the military and the government um, retelling of events during the war and takes their propaganda and turns it around and shows the audience and that the government will change the narrative to fit their agenda and motives. Moving towards a post-Vietnam era, Rambo First Blood is about a Vietnam veteran who is mistreated by society, including the government. By the end of the film, he has an emotional breakdown and he reveals his trauma caused by the Vietnam War. He says, I come back to the world and I see all those maggots at the airport protesting me, spitting, calling me baby killer and all kinds of vile crap. This critical counter narrative reveals the mistreatment of Vietnam veterans, how both society and the government not only gives up on them, but also rejects them to reintegrate society, especially when they're at their lowest point returning from war. Top Gun is the guiltiest of being state propaganda piece by the Department of Defense. According to the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs, Robert B. Sims admitted that in most cases, it's in the best interest of the government to support motion picture or television to portray the military positively to avoid distorted images that might be conveyed without the Department of Defense's assistance. The film received 100% cooperation from the Navy by the Pentagon. The film uses the Navy aircraft carrier and F-14s. The Navy had a recruiting station right outside of the movie theaters. As a result of the film's success, the Navy saw a rise in recruitment over 20%. Moreover, the film made $300 million worldwide, meaning other people from other nations saw this propaganda piece. And let's not forget to mention Top Gun Maverick 2020. After 36 years, the film still has relevance and cultural impact today as it grossed over $1 billion. In an interview with Air Force Senior Master Sergeant Maldonado, he spoke with a young man before the film about enlisting and the young man debated about the idea of joining the Air Force, but later said, after watching the film, that was my tipping point and I want to start the process. Lastly, we follow along a documentary called Fahrenheit 9-11. After the September 11th, 2001 attacks against the United States, President George W. Bush called upon a war on terrorism. The US invaded Afghanistan and will later invade Iraq. 
Many veterans and service members of the Afga Afghanistan and Iraq war say that popular 1980s films such as Top Gun had inspired them into serving the US military, but would soon find out that the portrayal in such films are false. As a result of past American war films, the propaganda used had convinced many young Americans to enlist in the military to fight for an unjust cause. By the end of the film, Moore and his production crew flooded the streets surrounding the Capitol building in Washington, DC, confronting congressional representatives. He asked them if they have sent their own children to fight in these wars, and they refused to answer. The scene transitions to a poor urban and rural communities and Americans saying, the very people forced to live in the worst parts of town, go to the worst schools and who have it the hardest are always the first to step up to defend the very system. The critical counter narrative used here highlights the hypocrisies, hypocr hypocrisies used by our own government and representatives to exploit our own people to fight against another nation by sending the ones in society who are disenfranchised the most. This is meant to tug at the heartstrings of the viewers to make them sympathize with Americans who were exploited. Uh, American war films play a fundamental role in creating popular culture in America. These films use propaganda to instill an idea of nationalism that we should fight for our country. However, films were later evolved to create a critical counter narrative to criticize the actions of our government. A viewer should be aware of the propaganda used in American war films, or at the very least, the dangers of propaganda to not be exploited because of an ulterior motive or agenda. If anything, American war films should be cautionary tales. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, now we will begin the Q&A portion of tonight's conference. If you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand using the Zoom function. You can also type your question into the chat. I guess I'll start us off with a question for all of our presenters. Um, what was the foundation for your presentation? Was it a class assignment? Um, and if so, would you tell us a bit about how your arguments have changed over time? Uh, Maricela, I guess we'll start with you and then uh, we can move to Christina and then Eduardo. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, so this was actually an assignment for a uh, professor uh, Phoenix uh, history and research writing class. And the only guideline that we were given was it has to be something having to do with the World War II time period. Other than that, it could be whatever we wanted. Um, and he happened to mention in one of our classes, Mexico's internment of its Japanese citizens. And it, it's something that struck me because I had never, I had never heard of that before. Um, and I actually, my interest in history came from studying World War II when I was about 15 years old. So I thought I knew everything there was to know. Um, so this is something that really struck me. And as a Latina of Mexican descent, I thought, how do we not know this? How do more of us not know about this? So it became really important for me to learn this history um, and share it with others. Uh, and initially, I was focusing only on uh, the differences between those interned here in the U.S. versus those in Mexico. Uh, but once I started learning a little bit more about how hesitant the Mexican people were uh, to interning their citizens, I thought, well, then why did they do it? And that's when it kind of shifted to, you know, trying to find out what there was underneath that. There's a lot to uncover, so I, I may actually continue this research, um, but it, it was a good start, I thought. Thank you. Uh, Christina? Uh, yeah, so great question. Um, I first, so I've always been interested in the Bracero program because probably like five, six years ago, um, probably longer, I found out my abuelito was, was a Bracero, right? So I've been knowing. And so when I took Dr. Suarez's um, historical research and writing class, I already knew like what topic I, I wanted to do when she, she gave us the, the option to choose a topic. And so I initially said the Bracero program, but that in itself is so broad. Um, so I had to obviously narrow down uh, my research, right? And kind of hone into a certain specific period, specific part of it right so I ended up uh, during that during that semester I actually had a gender and sexuality and history class that I was very interested in and I, I'm still very interested in and in, in gender and sexuality overall and so I said oh maybe I could mix what I've learned in gender and sexuality and bring it to my topic in the Bracero program and so that's how it 
was born. And I'm still, I, I'm, I still to this day, like research a lot of the Bracero. Um, It's kind of been evolving into, I want to get into the labor unions and how that sprouted from the Bracero program. So it's definitely opened up a whole can of worms in my research. Wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Um, and Eduardo? Yeah, so my research was a part of a class. It was the World Film History, I believe, with Dr. Afshin Asghari. And my research, I was a little naive going into it. And I was like, oh, you know, this wouldn't be too crazy. And then it be, kind of became like a can of worms. You know, it was a lot of films that I can choose from. And a lot of these I've already seen before, but I wasn't viewing them under a critical lens. So like my second time viewing these films, I was really like really into it. And I had to like do a deep analysis and I had to do a lot of research and it really like opened up a lot of like thoughtful questions that I had and and I just kept going and going and it was really it was really rewarding, I feel like. Thank you, thank you. Um so we do have a question from Cole. Cole, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, everyone else. Wonderful presentations. My question is for Maricela. I was wondering if you knew any more about this water park. Like, if there are any movements to try to memorialize it. If you know anyone who's been there, like that, just seems like such a strange thing to me. I do you know any more on that? Thank you for the question, Cole. Um, so uh, there, there's been a lot of. Um, push from many citizens uh, for Mexico to acknowledge uh, the internment. Uh, with the water park specifically, uh, there hasn't been much mention of that. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's there's like a small little plaque at the entrance of the water park, just to kind of briefly detail some of the history and what happened there. But aside from that, there's not much more. Um, and I do actually, um, when I was doing this research, I reached out to family that I have in Mexico and I asked them, you know, if they could dig around for me a little bit. Um, and even they had a hard time finding information on this. So it's it's definitely something that has been swept under the rug. Um, I hope to someday visit uh, the place just so that I can say, you know, I've been here and, you know, just kind of see what I can find. Um, but unfortunately, no, there, there's nothing as far as the water park itself is concerned. There's just that push from some citizens for the recognition that it happened. Um, but even that is, you know, there's there's silence on the government's end as far as that's concerned. Thank you. Fascinating. Okay. Um, so another question I had kind of for, for all the presenters, um, I guess if you could talk a bit about um, any difficulties you encountered in gathering sources um, for your subjects. And I guess we can go in the same order, starting with Maricela and Christina. Eduardo. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, it, it was incredibly difficult <laughs> to find information on this topic. Um, a lot of the information that I got, I got from uh, Dr. Jerry Garcia's book, Looking Like the Enemy. Um, that was my starting point. Um, and I looked at the sources that he used um, and went that way. And then from there, you know, started finding other sources. Um, but unfortunately, there is not much on this topic. Um, and, you know, I did, I reached out, you know, to family that I have there and asked them to, you know, look it up, you know, since they have a VPN from Mexico, you know, I thought maybe they could access a little more information than I could. And no, th there's just, there's not much. So it's, I'm definitely interested in continuing the research because of that, because I want to find out why there isn't more information out there. But that was a huge challenge for me, just getting any information. Thank you, Christina. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so with the Bracero program, there is a lot of information, you know, but it, it only captures, well, not only, but it, the majority of the sources out there are all centered on the men, which, of course, they were part of it. Um, I'm not discrediting that in any way, shape, or form. Like I said, my abuelito was a Bracero, so, you know, got to pay our respects to that. However, there wasn't much on the women's or the family's um, perspective of the Bracero program. So it was a little hard, but um, my starting point actually was Mireya Losa defined Bracero. She wrote a book. And from there, kind of like uh, how Mari was talking about how she started looking at 
the, their sources. So I started there and then I ventured out to other sources and I came across a few articles. But even as I mentioned in my presentation, like when I researched uh, pictures, because a lot of it was a, a visual paper, right? There's a lot of pictures and I wanted to give it like a visual feel to, visual feel to it. Um, there wasn't many women's pictures in, in the whole Bresetto archive, like I mentioned, like just specifically women, even then there wasn't, but with women being kind of like the center message of the photo was only about three, uh, three, two, maybe, but just women by themselves, women and what they've been through, nothing really. So it was kind of hard to find a lot of visuals in the women's side, but um, yeah, I did have a little difficulty on, on the research, but but it was I it was worthwhile to keep digging. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Eduardo, I didn't have any difficulty finding any sources in my research. Like there was a plethora of uh, valuable sources. So if anything, I had like a hard time just kind of pinning down what I wanted to use. And there was a lot to read. So I was really lucky to have a lot of sources on there. And I think like the harder part was watching the films. So I have to like pick which ones I want to watch and like which ones really have a compelling underlying theme and message in there and that ties in with the sources and stuff like that so I got really lucky with my research thank you thank you and then I have a a few questions um specific uh for each presenter um I guess starting with um Maricela could you tell us a bit about a bit more about the difficulties in comparing this with other contemporary historical episodes. You mentioned a bit about, you know, the, the problematic nature of that word concept or that phrase concentration camp, but could you tell us a bit about you know, that difficulty and how you navigated that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, my love for history came from, you know, learning about World War II. So for me personally, I have that attachment to the term concentration camp. When I think of it, and I think of, you know, all the atrocities and, you know, everything that happened in Europe. So when I first started doing my research here, and I started coming across the term concentration camp, I thought, wait a minute, like, why would you use it? You know, it's not the same. Why would you use that term? And I started digging into it a little bit deeper. And actually, um, one of my other sources um, that I use quite a bit uh, was a book by Dr. Selfa Chu. And um, she did a lot of research on this topic and she conducted a lot of interviews. And um, in one of these interviews, she does discuss this specifically. And she says that, you know, it's very important that we don't water down the history, you know? So the term concentration camp is the accurate term because there was a concentration of Japanese immigrants here. So, um, you know, she explains that it's not, it's not any sort of comparison. It's not any sort of trying to equate what happened in Mexico to what happened in Europe, um, but that it is very important that we, you know, don't water down these histories and that we present them as they were. Um, so she's very steadfast on, nope, we're going to keep using the term concentration camp. Um, so I, I learned to, you know, to respect that, that aspect of it, especially coming from someone like who, like her, who was directly affected by this. So I thought, you know, we, we get to take the lead from those who are actually affected by these histories. And so if she says it's concentration camp and she provides a good explanation for it, then, you know, as historians, we get to take that into account and that's what we get to use as our guide. So that, that's why I, I chose to, you know, point that out and, and keep that term as well. Thank you for that question, Robert. Thank you. Um... A question for Christina, um, I guess, given the personal nature of the topic, um, how did your grandparents react when you told them about this project and, and what was that interview process like? Thank you, Robert. That's a really good question. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning how we don't, it's worth talking about the stuff we don't talk about, right? So as far as my grandparents go, it was very surface level. Um, I, I didn't go and, you know, show them my paper and I read it to them and I said, look, this is what I found out. You know, some of, some of them had STDs. Like I, you know, it was very, <laughs> there's, there's, there's this still, um, I would say barrier between being open with my grandparents, given the 
my cultural background and how we don't talk about things and how we, you know, brush everything off and sweep it under the rug kind of vibe. Um, and, and not on purpose, you know, I think that's just how things are. And so there was many times, um, I did interview, but indiscreetly, you know, I, it was just conversation to be honest. Like I, I didn't sit there with a pen and paper and a notepad. And I said, okay, here it is. I'm going to record everything. Like if I were to do that to my grandma and to my grandpa, I feel like they would be very turned off. It's like, I'm taking from their, their own experience and their own history. And I would never want to do that. So everything I've gathered has been very genuine and very natural. Um, I, my goal and my aim isn't to, you know, have a transcript in every conversation we have, you know, it's, it's to build connection and, and build that community uh, and build that bridge between my answers, ancestors and today, right? So with that said, um, I did mention that I, I've been working on this research, they know I've been in school, and they're really proud of me. Uh, my grandma, every time I speak to her, she tells me, Estoy muy orgullosa de ti. Sigue adelante. Keep going. I'm very proud of you. She tells me every time. Um, she doesn't really ask me about my research, but I still tell her. I'm like, oh, yeah, I learned about this. And, you know, in Mexico, this. So I'll talk to her again naturally, very natural. And my grandpa, unfortunately, he's he's uh, pushing like 91 or so. So it's very hard for me to communicate. So the times he has told me about the Bessero program, I cherish those moments. And you know, I did interview him or spoke to him naturally a few years ago, and and I, I've always loved history, so an oral history particularly. So after our conversation, I I went home and and I wrote down in in my journal just because I love to write, and I would just I wrote everything everything down in my day with him that day, and so now I can look back and see that. So again, um, they're very proud of me. They respond, you know, that they're always proud of me and. I'm just very grateful uh, to have them in my life. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I guess my last question uh, for Eduardo would be on this, the propagandistic element of these films. Have you found yourself enjoying some of these films that you're, when you're aware that they're propaganda pieces? And, and if so, how do you reconcile those, those two things, you know, enjoying a film on the one hand, but also being aware that the audience is being manipulated in a particular way. Great question, Robert. Yeah, so I remember watching Top Gun Maverick when it came out. I was right there in the movie theater seat. I was watching it. And I'm, the whole time I had like the biggest smile and I was just like, man, this is pretty cool. I got to be honest. And I was thinking maybe I should join the Navy. But then I'm like, no, wait, that's exactly what they, they want. That's like their exact message. It's not outright saying it, but the under, it's underlined right there just so it's not too obvious, but it's there. And the way I reconcile, the, you know, the difference is that I can separate that message from the film itself, you know, and just enjoy it. As long as I know it's there, I'm aware. And I hope the audience is similar to me, like they know it's there. I think it's fine to enjoy the film for what it is. You know, it's just like Top Gun Maverick, it's just planes flying, it's exhilarating, it's fun, but it, it is difficult, you know, there are instances where people are influenced by these uh, underlying messages and some people don't even acknowledge it or they don't even recognize it. Thank you, thank you. Um, I guess with that, uh, that pretty much wraps up our Q&A portion. Uh, we'll now conclude our, our conference tonight. Um, I would like to thank again, uh, all of uh, the people in attendance uh, for, for making it to tonight's conference. Um, I would also like to thank our presenters, Marisela Varela Ramos, Cristina Esquivel, and Eduardo Magallanes uh, for delivering those wonderful presentations. Um, thank you again to Dr. Kitia Lee and uh, Dr. Enrique C. Ochoa for graciously offering their time to provide feedback to our presenters, to Dr. Birta Flager for providing feedback at every critical juncture, um, and to my fellow Perspectives team members for your various contributions to tonight's conference. A recording of this event will be posted on the Cal State LA Perspectives page. Um, a link to that page and recording will also be posted on the Perspectives Instagram page. Um, thanks again, everyone. Uh, take care and have a wonderful night. Bye.